Welcome to Humanist Views, a program where we look at current issues from a humanist point of view. I'm Scott Lohman. On tonight's program, we're going to take a look at something a little off the norm for what we do in a program, which is take a look at a more personal story of one individual's journey to humanism. And that's not something that most people will find out about. I know if you watch certain Christian programming, you'll see people talking about their, their journey to faith or when they got saved or whatever terminology they use for that. because. Um, I'm not well versed in that, so uh, you'll see that, but sometimes journeys to humanism go on many different paths and come from many different points of view. There are people in our community who were raised um, with no belief in a supernatural, and then there are those of us who came from a family background being in religion. So joining me tonight is Mark Tosin, and Mark, welcome to the program. Thanks, Scott. Nice to be here. And it's um, going to be interesting to have this. So let's let's just get started. Did you were you raised in a in a free thinking family, or was it your traditional coming out of religion? I, I came from a pretty religious family. My my father was a Lutheran pastor, um, so a, a lot of that. But I found out right about in my middle teens that I didn't get it basically, and uh, um, I I stayed at home and, uh, and was a, a good son and, and basically uh, just kind of lived within that framework until I moved out on my own and then I just stopped paying any attention. So, Yeah, that's a, that happens with a number of us because my dad was a funeral director so I was brought to church every week and then even helped him with funerals. So um, I got to see a wide variety of different churches. So mm -hmm. what got, was it just that it didn't take in a sense or were you always thinking about things and just not adding up? Um, it just didn't seem like it made sense to me. Um, the, the ideas of, uh, of the supernatural just never seemed to really fit with the way my, my brain was piecing things together over time. So. so as you're looking at the world, it's like, okay, there's this over here that does not add up with the rest of this over there. Kind of like that. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So then, you know, you went through life that way, but now you've, you've joined us with the Humanists of Minnesota. And what kind of brought you to us? Well, it's about three years ago, in, in, um, which would have been 2009, um, and um, I was looking to expand my circle of friends, basically. And so I went to a place called meetup.com, okay. and I made a profile and, and uh, um, listed the things that I was interested in, one of which was agnosticism and, and uh, uh, others being philosophy and um, uh, um, poker because I was okay. a poker player just you know whatever it was that I, my interests were and um, meetup.com has a nice interface for being able to get um, connected with other people that are nearby that have similar interests to you and um, the humanists of Minnesota came up through that okay um, and I happened to be living just a few blocks away from where the humanists meet at the Nokomis Community Center on Minnehaha Parkway and so I thought hey I can do that that's easy so it was a third Saturday of the month and I thought I'll go to there and, uh, and that's how I ended up coming to my very first meeting. So, yes, and so you've been attending, so found us that way. And then did you start exploring more about the specifics of humanism at that point? Um, a little bit. More, more of interest to me were the speakers at the time, okay. you know? And um, I was interested in what was being um, brought up. I don't even remember specifically what the speakers were three years ago anymore. Um, but they were always of interest, you know? They were, um, intellectuals and people that were free thinkers and and it was non-religious and it was uh, uh you know the group of people that were attending were obviously really really intelligent folk that were welcoming and and uh um you know i tended to be kind of quiet sat by myself nobody pushed me to do anything and so it was a nice comfortable place um one of the things that happened very quickly was uh at the kind of uh, the the uh, the table with all the information on it, you know, the newsletters and, and things that are set out for people. Um, someone had left a copy of a book right there that um, I was drawn to the title of, and it was a book called On Being Certain. I've got it here somewhere. Here it is. That's that one. Um, and uh, because in my, in my growing up years, the idea of faith was kind of not, you know, I wasn't sure about that, and mm -hmm. I had considered myself an agnostic for a long time. Um, that the title of the book really kind of grabbed me. So I wrote it down and I went, uh, when I went home, I looked it up and got myself a copy and started reading that. And that, that really made me very, very interested. And I've been coming to the humanist meetings ever since. Basically. Okay. And what specifically in the book caught your attention? Well, it kind of goes back a long ways to my 
you know, not paying attention to religion basically is another way of saying that I just kind of thought about it in a lot of different ways, but it didn't really come up for me in my life very much. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, you know, I, I went from a place personally where I thought that basically consciousness was lots of different levels of trance. Um, I thought that uh, I had a, an idea that what belief was was something that was something that comforted people and, and also something that put blinders on people. And so I, I was kind of living within that framework of the idea of belief. And uh, on being certain, the book itself, it really talks about a particular place in the brain that gives you this sensation of certainty. Okay. And I could see that the belief systems of my parents and uh, the people that I grew up with as a, as a youngster um, really gave them a, a, a comfort level. And I kind of associated that with their belief system. Um, and so I, I read through the book and found that I'm, I was thinking about it a little differently than what the neurology actually says is going on. Okay. So that got me really very, very interested. And, and I've, I've been involved with a humanist <clears throat> then um, for uh, another year or so, and then uh, um, got involved by volunteering on the board. And uh, Humanists in Minnesota has, been, has allowed me to do a book club and, um, and explore the idea of belief itself. And so I've surrounded myself with these very intelligent people from the clump, from the association mm -hmm. and from books that they recommended and books that I was interested in. And we've had some wonderful discussions over the last eight or nine months or so. Yeah, that's gotta be very interesting because I've read a number of books on how our brains work and you, you discovered that our brain is cobbled together of different bits and pieces and modules and all sorts of things. And it's just amazing that we can actually reason and then figure out that our brain has things that's going to throw us off. Like you've got a book uh, you know, on the top that I'm just seeing, which is don't believe everything you think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Thomas Kaida lists uh, six basic mistakes that we make in thinking. And they're very, very, very interesting. Um, we started with the book club kind of exploring the idea of a, what the first book was called Super Sense. Okay. And it, it basically is talking about a, a sensation that we have about um, that which is the supernatural. And um, I, um, I liked that book a lot, so I brought it to the book club as a first, as a first book and then asked for uh, other suggestions. And Thomas Kaida's book, Don't Believe Everything You Think, then um, uh, was one of those that we did a little bit later on. Yeah. But we, we followed SuperSense with the one that I had picked up originally, you know, okay. on, on being certain. And um, one of the things that I learned uh, early in, in those readings um, is that, you know, I, actually I looked up the, the um, in a, I have a very old Webster's dictionary, and mm -hmm. I looked up the definition of belief. And that old Webster's of mine says that belief is, persuasion of the truth of anything. Okay. And I, I think I've been living with that definition for a very, very long time. And what On Being Certain talks about, and what Super Sense talks about, and what the last book of our series, The Belief Instinct, talks about, uh -huh. is really that um, belief is a feeling. It's something that happens before you analyze the reasons for what you believe. Okay. It's a sensation that comes up just like um, feeling something or, or smelling something or tasting something. You actually get a sensation of belief before you then use your analytical mind to kind of piece together why you believe it. Okay. Because a belief comes up from the unconscious, it comes up from your feeling parts. Yeah, and that's really fascinating, especially like the subtitle they've got on the cover is believing you are right even when you're not. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it does talk about our, you know, our cobbled together brain on how they've looked at how we talk, they'll put people into MRI machines and have them set, you know, just do things with their hand and watch the brain center. The hand will be moving before they say, I'm telling my hand to move. Yeah. And that's just so fascinating on how we sort of do those things in our head. Yeah, another really good example of that is just a, uh, was used in a couple of the books is um, the way a professional baseball player hits the ball. 
is they're at the plate with the bat at the ready and they've got a lot of information uh, both experientially and their own body training mm -hmm. that is ready to go and what they believe that they're doing is watching the pitcher and making a decision at the last possible moment to swing or not swing. Mm -hmm. And what the neuroscience tells us is there isn't enough time for their brain to actually do that. That what they're doing is they're, they're justifying or rationalizing or analyzing their action afterwards to say why it is that they swung or didn't swing. That's why you see a lot of strikeouts in baseball. Well, yeah. <laughs> cause because the pitcher Fix, uh, fl uh, fakes them out, basically. Yep, yeah. Exactly. That's you know fascinating. I didn't know they had studied baseball players that way, on you know just trying to figure out how our brains do things, mm -hmm. and you know then this also helps because you know we as humanists know that w you know we we're, we're pattern seeking animals. We do that, and these help us try and figure out where we can stop our natural things from leading us wrong. Because what worked well in the African veldt doesn't work well when you're driving 60 miles an hour down the highway. Yep, absolutely. Pattern seeking is very much a, a, a theme in a lot of these books, really. They're talking about the kind of evolutionary um, aspects of our, of our physical brains and bodies that, uh, are, that, you, that, that adapted themselves for best possible um, scenarios for the species, basically, over, over a long, long, long period of time. And one of the things that human beings are very, very good at, um, uh, better than uh, pretty much all the other species, is um, an extrapolation into what it is that someone else intends or means. Okay. And uh, so if I, if I look at you, for instance, and you happen to glance down at the books, I'm thinking, oh, he's checking out which book is next and stuff like that. And I can extrapolate what's going on in your head. And, uh, and human beings do that really, really well compared to other species. And it's one of our best survival mechanisms because instead of just um, knowing what we can see in front of us, we also can extrapolate from our information and memory of the past into the future and, and make decisions about what's going to happen. And you add into that um, language uh, and, the, and, a, and a more sophisticated language perhaps than other species have. And, and then the ability to write it down and pass it down from generation to generation to generation, the accumulated knowledge that we have as human beings comes very much into play with how successful we are as a species. And we also use a lot of that information and have used it in the last few thousands of years to attach to things like religion where we're, we're connecting um, what it is that we think someone means or what it is that we think God is going to do for us or to us, et cetera, as, uh, as meaning and intent and purpose. And we're extrapolating onto things that actually don't exist a lot of times. We, so, can, we can put meaning on you know, why the tree fell down at that particular moment, why the wind chime jingled when I was thinking about grandma. You know, anything at all, we, we can put meaning to. So. You know, so it kind of like it goes back. There was a um, church convention that happened here in the Twin Cities a couple of years ago, and they were voting on gay rights within their church for their pastors. And while they were doing that, there was a uh, tornado storm that went through Minneapolis at the time. And they, a bunch of them said, oh, it's a sign of God that the tornado came through on that, other than not realizing, okay, it's July in Minnesota, <laughs> which is tornado season. And even, even though many tornadoes do not go through a major downtown, they still do. So that's a case of reading meaning into that based on I would say usually a poor connection between cause and effect. Well, it's that and, and another, another thing that comes into play is that we tend to ascribe meaning to things that we first don't understand and second, connect with us on an emotional level that's very strong. If we, if we get information that's basically data that doesn't really connect to us on an emotional level, we're far less likely to ascribe some kind of supernatural meaning or <laughs> purpose to that. But when somebody dies in the family or when an accident happens that really messes up your life or whatever, uh, an emotional reaction kind of leaves us wide open to try and figure out why it happened. And we'll ascribe things to it that aren't necessarily logical. 
Yeah, and that, that's, you know, a fascinating thing we, that we humans do. And this is probably why there are so many different variations on gods out there as well. It's because, you know, they first started out being gods of nature. There's this god that throws the lightning bolts down, and there's another one that makes the sound of the thunder. Mm -hmm. uh, until we started understanding how clouds operate. Sure. So I'm sure that's, you know, how those cases happen and why for a long time gods had a, a location as opposed to just the sky god. And you can see when you look at the Middle East is the thing that dominates their area is the sun in that part and why the three major religions in that area are monotheistic mm -hmm. yeah. because of the domination of that thing. Um, on this one, um, just you know, jump around here is don't believe everything you think the six basic mistakes is that he's got them on the cover, which is really cool. You can summarize them is the first one is we prefer stories to statistics. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. If uh, I've learned that just recently, I've written a couple of things for the, uh, uh, the humanist newsletter. And um, I find that I feel more engaged even as a writer when I include something that's a little bit personal like a story as opposed to just kind of dive in and tell you which part of your brain is the uh, uh, is responsible for your sensation of belief or something like that. If I tell you a little bit about something where I used belief in my life, it's more engaging for the reader as well. And that happens all day long. What it is that excites us what it is that interests us is stories mm -hmm. somebody start trying to pound you away at at you with uh uh, data and statistics and it was news time it's going so. yeah yeah most people don't, don't get excited about that except for some types of baseball fans and sports fans they get <laughs> really into statistics if we do that um, we seek to confirm not to question our ideas uh-huh um it's um it's less likely i guess to say that we would um we would be looking for meaning or a different a, a different idea about what it is that we're trying to figure out mm -hmm. if we come up with something or, or something uh, something comes to mind that already fits it um, and so once you feel like you once you get a, a feeling like oh well that's the that's the reason that's the answer you stop looking for other ideas basically yeah and, and so um, uh, often when when a, a question or an idea comes to mind that we're that we are not sure about we begin to search around in our memory for, for things that are uh, related to it. And the, the unconscious is very, very good at providing lots and lots of examples, some of which don't fit and some of which do. And the analytical part of the brain basically sorts through what is presented to it and comes up with, oh, that's this one. Yeah, uh, that's just cool. About, and, and we can all see times when we've done that where we've had a story that you know, we've confirmed, then you go back and look and you said, I just stopped at the wrong spot on that one. Yeah. And it says, we rarely appreciate the role of chance and coincidence in shaping events. Oh, definitely can see that. You Any know, tornadoes. Tornadoes, absolutely. Any, anybody that's ever played a slot machine knows that, oh, the, I've had five in a row that have taken my quarter, the next one's got to work. Mm -hmm. And it's always random. It, yep. There isn't any next one that's going to be better. It really isn't. Even but, with the coin flips. They but it absolutely feels that way. Oh, yeah. The machine is made to make you feel that way, in fact. So, yeah, yeah they are, they're definitely playing on human weaknesses yep. there. We sometimes misperceive the world around us. Yeah, you know, this is one that I, I, I can't actually say that I, I recall a really good example from, of that one in the book, but uh, you, anyone knows that, you know, you, you go back and look at something that somebody told you, no, you know, you saw that wrong, and you look and you go, well, of course I did. Sometimes we see what we want to see, mm -hmm. because the, our, our brain is looking for the answer that it already thinks is going to fit. Exactly. Yeah. We tend to oversimplify our thinking, too. Always, you know, it, it's it's much easier to go through life if you if you shorten things down and take the uh, uh, the abridged version. Mm -hmm. You know, if you if you had to stop and examine every possible aspect of your unconscious as to why you're making a particular decision, you'd still be on the one that you were trying to make when you were two. Definitely, <laughs> and we have faulty memories. We do, yep. and uh, a surprise to me about memory is actually that. Um, I, I guess I, I thought about memory as a, uh, a kind of a data bank that it's mm -hmm. all in there to be accessed at any given at, at any like given moment. Kind of like recording like the old camera idea on that, even though we 
are now knowing, no, it doesn't do that. It doesn't actually work that way. Certainly we have very strong memories that, that exist, but each time we access them, we are in a different place, smelling a different thing, seeing and touching and feeling different things around us, and all of those memories get associated with whatever it is that we re are remembering or bringing up or talking about. So memory is not only the stuff that's back there in the database, but it's everything else that gets attached to it over time. And, and it, it's changeable, and, it, and you can actually misremember things. Your brain is not always and completely on top of its game. So. Definitely not. Yeah. So um, through the variety of books, I mean, you've got one called The Little Book of Atheist Spirituality. Yeah, that, was, that was a little departure for the group. It was very interesting. Yeah, so um, what, what struck you about this one? Well, André Comte de Spanville is a, a French philosopher uh, of some renown in France. I had never heard of him before, but the book's title really stuck out to me because um, atheists generally shy away from the idea of spirituality yes. in, 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 at, at all. Yeah, and even, so I was, even humanists move away from that word just because it's got so many different connotations. That I usually say you can slip through a small aircraft carrier, car carrier group right. through that and still have space to spare. This, this little book, uh, I think, got the most diverse response to, in, in okay. my book club that, of any of the other books that we did um, because it, it, it talks about spirituality in a sense of kind of um, the experience that we sometimes get of kind of feeling at one with nature. Like if you're out in the woods and you've had a lovely day and the sun is shining and, it's, and, the, and a hawk flies over, you know, and you're remembering um, all the good things that happened that during the day and you're thinking about what, how, what a nice meal you've got waiting for you when you get back to the campfire and mm -hmm. everything is just working out great and you just feel at one with nature. There are kind of moments that we have where the, uh, maybe it's the endorphins, maybe it's the chemicals, maybe mm -hmm. it's the sunshine, maybe it's all of those things that just really kind of throws our brain into a kind of a, a reverie, mm -hmm. you know, it's a really lovely thing. And Comte de Sponville is really talking about that as a spiritual experience. Okay. So in the book club, there were people, you know, I, I asked people to rate things on a scale of one to 10. And there were people that gave this book a two. Wow. Because no, that's not spirituality. Spirituality is, you know, belief in, in mm -hmm. spirit, uh, uh, the, the supernatural and stuff like that. And others really, really got that, 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 experience that they that they have inside their brain is really very special mm -hmm. to them and and uh, and they understand that for themselves as a kind of personal spirituality so uh, that was a very interesting kind of departure for the book talking about that in a way of belief systems and then the you know the other one that that I've read this guy's columns which is the belief instinct Jesse Baring who mm -hmm. writes for scientific American on psychology yeah this one I think uh, was my favorite. It was the last one that we did. Um, the, the series is over now. I'm, I will probably do another book club in, a, in the near future, most likely on the, uh, on the subject of consciousness. Um, but the, uh, uh, the belief instinct really talks about um, uh, a very interesting aspect of, of what, we, what I kind of referred to before, uh, Jesse Bering calls it, and he, I, he's referring to other people who have called it as well, mm -hmm. uh, the theory of mind. Okay. That when we look at other people and we assume or we guess at what it is that is going on inside their head, um, we are essentially assuming that there's a, there is somebody in that body. So it's kind of a dualistic point of view. And the theory of mind, a the theory of what it is that's happening in your mind, is something that we do all the time. We do it to inanimate objects as well. Mm -hmm. And it's very much uh, like an instinct. It's like the feeling of belief. Um, so the, uh, uh, that particular book I, I liked very much because it talks about how that relates to the idea of soul and destiny and the meaning of life and purpose and, and a whole bunch of different stuff. So uh, uh, it's a very well-written book. Yeah, so you have lots of you know, fascinating, and then there's one last one here, how we decide, Jonah Lehrer. Jonah Lehrer, I actually hear him quite a bit on podcasts through, um, uh, I think it's Fresh Air and um, uh, a couple of others uh, mm -hmm. off of uh, NPR. And another well-written book, um, very much um, within this framework of the ones that we did kind of in the center of the series, talking about the brain and how it functions and some of the limits uh, to how we think and what we do 
um, and 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 how that relates to the idea of soul and purpose and meaning and stuff. Okay, yeah. You know, so you've got a, it, this looks like a, a really neat mix of books. So you said people were rating them. What was their reaction overall to the series? Did you, people get very interested or? Most of the books that we did rated um, on average around a six or seven. So I think that um, the the suggestions that I got from people and the ones that I picked out early on um, really were interesting to most people. We had uh, anywhere, uh, I tried to limit the groups to about 15 people and we had 15 a couple of times. Sometimes the, the attendance was more like six or seven. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, um, but it was, um, most of the books rated it right around in the six or seven range. So um, it's a really interesting, it was a, it was absolutely fascinating for me and something that I really thank the Humanists of Minnesota for allowing me to do because um, just to be able to come to an organization that, that, um, ha that is gathering free thinking individuals to talk about science and reason and, um, and things without the supernatural, it was a, a wonderful thing for me to find. Uh, and I've really begun to identify myself as a humanist just within the last year, rather than just an agnostic, because the the precept the the, um, the purpose and the and the the way that the humanists of Minnesota and the American Humanist Association uh, put themselves together really kind of fits my lifestyle. So. Well, that's, that's great um, because as you know, humanists, all of your books show the reason why science and rationality are so important to us because they allow us to look past our weaknesses in our brain that you, you've had a number of books that point out where, you know, the, the one is like, okay, we got bad memories, we make assumptions about things and we do the lazy way out. And science as a process allows us to step back, double check, avoid all of those things. And I guess that's why we as humanists like that serious process. Mm -hmm. And then the thinking part, um, the fact that, you know, you've got seven books here and that's a lot of work. Well, it was it was very enjoyable. You know, if I if I flipped any of these through, you'd see the the tons of uh, highlighting and and underlining that I did and stuff. It it was a, a slow read for me each month, but um, very very enjoyable. It was like studying. It was like going back to school on a subject that I really really enjoyed. So and it was fun. That makes it a lot of fun. That's yeah. one thing I have noticed about us humanists is we seem to have insatiable curiosity, and sometimes <laughs> it's on crazy things, and other times. You know, it's fascinating, like how our brain works. So thanks, Mark. You bet. Really appreciate you coming in. And for more information on us, the Humanists of Minnesota, you can go to our website. So go to www.humanistsofmn.org. And we'd like to hear what you think about this program. So you can send us a letter, the old fashioned, stick a stamp on it, or you can send an email, give us a call. We'd like to hear from you. So thank you for joining me on this edition of Humanist Views. I'm Scott Lohman. Good night. <laughs>